and so I almost didn't make it. But um, I want to thank you for the invitation for being here, and I want to acknowledge and, um, any knowledge keepers in the room. I want to acknowledge the unceded territories of indigenous peoples on whom we, we sit. All of Canada is unceded territories, um, full stop. Um, and I, I work, um, I, I, I try and say uh, a few words in the language of my ancestors. So, Berry La Valley edition, because Saint Laurent don't dream of one to them. Je m'appelle Berry La Valley. Mes parents sont venus d'un petit village au Manitoba, un village métis, où le plusieurs de personnes parlent à peu près quatre langues: Soto, Cree, ou Métis français et anglais. And um, when I grew up, um, I heard many languages, um, even though I was the first generation to. Uh, to live in Winnipeg, because in the late 50s, um, our community people had to leave uh, uh, the community because of economic reasons. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, so, so, so anyway, and I give that history uh, about my community having to leave because of economic reasons, because in reality, when we look at chronic diseases in First Nations and Indigenous peoples, it's not a consequence of, of what we eat in reality, okay? So the real theory that emerges around chronic diseases for First Nations people is really that chronic diseases are a consequence of intergenerational things that go on in settler society to displace indigenous peoples from the thing that settler society wants. Because the real question at, at, uh, in conversation here, uh, people come here, diabetic nurses, diabetologists, endocrinologists, physicians, advocates and things like that, and we, we center things around the disease, and then we center things around the indigenous person in disease, and then we center it on things like devices, um, whether or not we eat certain calories, so many carbohydrates, what kind of insulins do we use, and the proximity of that kind of analysis around the indigenous body in context with chronic diseases fails to uh, allow us to move to actually a broader analysis. So really in theory, the creation of chronic diseases in a community like First Nations people started two, three hundred years ago. And it had a very specific intentionality, even if that thing called colonization and the development and emergence of settler society had no specific intelligence right, about that. So when you think of things, for example, um, I'm going to do a talk at a pediatric obesity conference in Ottawa, I think next month or something like that. And, and so the issue is around First Nations children and high obesity levels. Well, yes, um, if we look at communities and we compare them to other communities, yes, indeed, uh, obesity rates and overweightness is higher. Yeah. So. The question you have to ask is why? And people will say, well, it's because moms don't know how to actually feed their kids, we should get dietitians on board, and we should actually have these kinds of things. But what the paradox is in a situation like that, and I mention obesity because of the association between being overweight, um, you know, insulin resistance and all of those kinds of things. The paradox is, is that if you look at racial groups across Canada, I would contend that it's indigenous peoples who experience hunger far more than non-indigenous people. And the paradox is, is that it's indigenous peoples who experience obesity compared to people who actually have food, right? And that's a paradox, right? So, for example, I have grandkids, I have three grandkids, they're small, and my kids have never experienced hunger but for my family, it's been 200 years, and I was the last person to experience hunger as I grew up. Like, isn't that bizarre? You have to think about that. 200, maybe 200, 300 years, who knows? And the evidence we have from James Daschuk, 
in one of his books around, um, around Western Manitoba, is that socially constructed hunger campaigns by the state and the system were employed as mechanisms to uh, ensure that Indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples, would go on to reserves in order to make room for the settlers from Europe, primarily at the time. And so the accountability is not just in the, in the immediate moment. The accountability is around what is Canada today. You have to ask the question. So you, as well, you have to ask the question, if diabetes, in fact, is killing Indigenous peoples or First Nations people disproportionately, it's, it's taking their legs away, they're going on dialysis, there's blindness, there's all kinds of things happening, uh, higher rates of cancer, I mean, that's not part of my research. Um, what is the intentionality of diabetes rates being high in First Nations communities? It has a purpose, and you have to ask that purpose. What is the purpose for First Nations people to be ill compared to other Canadians? What is it? What do we have that, that, that social murder of Indigenous peoples continues and in blindness? Because all we do is we talk about, mm, we can't afford to actually get you to get a second opinion, even though you're up in northern Ontario. That's allocated no for the settler in the south to get second and third opinions about a disease. Right? Everything goes to the economics. And I would argue, and in, in, in no... Uh, disrespect to my uh, colleague over here, that the economics, the proving of the economic benefit of early prevention does not move the system. It does not. And again, and no offense to people in the, in the audience, this storytelling and the heart-tugging stories about what happened to us will not move Ottawa. Because you have to ask the question, why does this occur? And really why it occurs is it be, it's because of the continual reacquisition of these unceded territories that is intimate. The land and the reacquisition of these lands by settler society is intimate to our pathology. And so we're recast as indigenous peoples as pathologized bodies. You're obese. Um, you have ulcers on your feet. Uh, you can't see, you go to dialysis three times a week, you died early from you know, because of chronic kidney disease. It appears to reflect the colonial narrative of the dead and dying Indian. Now for those of you in the audience here who are not indigenous, the stuff that I say can kind of make you feel a bit uncomfortable in the belly, because indeed, the construction of social, social, of settler power and privilege is intimate to one thing. It's intimate to, and Shireen Razak, who was at uh, University of Toronto until she moved to UCLA, um, in her papers um, says that two things must occur in order for Canada as a settler society to continue to exist. Number one, the Indian must be seen to be dying, and our, our literature and our, our, our studies show that. And finally, the Indian must die. But those two particular factors are intimate to the reacquisition continually of the land and the exploitation of that land. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not a greenie. I know very little about environmentalism. But I know that the relationship of this country to its land, the people who are in the way are the living Indians. So when I teach at the medical school where I'm at, um, I teach the students um, about critical thinking and understanding disease and understanding population health from that context. If you don't ask the right questions, you'll not see, you will not find the answers or at least some level of understanding. Now, you may be asking, for those of you who might be indigenous or might not be indigenous, so, okay, yeah, we know about the residential schools, we know about the 60 scoops, we know about the famine experiment, experiments on people who are living today, they're the ones who were experimented on after Second World War where our country signed an obligation to never conduct human experience experiments. And you have to ask, 
Why do these things occur? And one of the things Razak does in her papers when she examines uh, the untimely deaths of indigenous men in custody, mostly in Western Canada, is she says that the Indian can be killed but never murdered. And you ask the question, what is the difference between to be murdered, murder, and kill? We can kill cows, and we can kill pigs, we can kill moose, we can kill you know, chickens, whatever it is. But you can also kill an Indian. Because in order to allocate murder onto the body of an indigenous person, that indigenous person must be fully recognized as human with our own humanity that's equal to any other race or ethnicity in the world. And that is functionally where we have to go. So the government of Canada, and if Trudeau was right here, I'd argue with him. I have no qualms at all. Okay? I would argue that indeed Canada permits the social murder of indigenous peoples by ignoring the obvious. And the one thing that I ask my students to do is do not accept the obvious. Ask about the obvious. Because the missing and murdered women in Canada were, it was the, our indigenous women who brought it to a political level where people said, oh, right, this is kind of wrong. But the previous government wanted to allocate each and every missing and murdered women to a singular event that the police should take care of, rather than a sociological phenomena where our indigenous women are not considered fully human, and therefore their death was not worthy of a state to say, this is not right. Now, what does that have to do with type 2 diabetes today? Type 2 diabetes is a marker illness that is colonially constructed. It's instructed in the, constructed in the fact that poverty as an independent risk factor for the health of a population is far more powerful than smoking. It's more powerful than a number of factors that we look at um, in medicine. It's poverty. And poverty is socially constructed. And poverty, therefore, can be socially deconstructed. I'm going to say one more statement that some of you won't like. A um, few things they don't like, but anyway. Recently, the Trudeau government agreed uh, to let in a group of people from the Middle East. Now, believe me, I have settler blood in me. I do. Um, and someone on TV said, in order to allow 25,000 people into Canada, we need about 3.2, 3.3 billion dollars in new and old resources in order to figure four things for people. Number one, you will see a doctor. Number two, you will have a school to educate your children. Number three, you will have a job. And number four, you will have a house. Four things. And you ask the question, if we go into our communities, Métis and First Nations and Inuit, what percentage of people have those four things? right now. I don't know what the stats are. What would the stats be? Those four things that are promised, they are, there's, um, they're confident that they can see a doctor. They're confident that they have a house that they can live in. And they're confident that I go to a job tomorrow, etc. It's not true. So ask the question, why is that so? Why is it that we continue to create a settler society in which uh, the lands are used to provide for the settler, and believe me, I'm not anti-Syrian or anything like that, okay? But ask the question, and why is it that the same state that does that denies access to the same resources for First Nations and Métis? And in that argument, you will find the origin of type 2 diabetes. One of the things that I do, uh, just a couple more minutes, is I do work in chronic kidney disease in First Nations people. I'm not a nephrologist, um, but I work with nephrologists in Winnipeg. We did a project called the Finish. It's a long acronym, but it's really examining, uh, trying to do a triad of things in a population-based uh, strategy. And that's number one, is to um, 
is to locate, uh, to screen, locate disease, and then it is to um, treat. So with the theory that we can, if we go early enough in a person's life and we find evidence of chronic kidney disease, and if we align treatment appropriately, we can uh, reduce the levels of, of di dialysis, which are really great for First Nations people in Manitoba. Um, and in that, in that particular project with uh, chronic kidney disease, um, we in fact um, bypassed the primary care system in Manitoba, and we got people directly to nephrologists, and we delayed, we delayed their delay in getting access to, to services. So, and, and it worked. And one thing that we, we realized is that when we engage with community in an appropriate level and way, we found that all communities really wanted help. And they obliged us to go into communities and to screen. And we realized as we moved along there that the stereotypes that are used about Indigenous people in health are just that, stereotypes. And stereotypes, again, are proxy to something that goes on in community. So I hope you didn't think that I'd come up here and tell you to use Lantus or rapid-acting insulin, which we do, um, you know. Um, but one of the things I'll tell you is that some of the work that we do with the Diabetes Integration Project, we use an anti-racist um, uh, way to engage with First Nations people. Because even as Indigenous people, we had to deconstruct ourselves and the notions that uh, we employed uh, from our schools of nursing and medicine to engage with our own people. And we found out that if you engage with people in a really respectful way, lo and behold, they take their metformin and they take their ramipril and they use their insulin and they stop smoking. And so in the, some of the data that we have from ours, which is a First Nations uh, intervention, is that our hemoglobin A1Cs with people who attended our clinics for about two or three times, their hemoglobin A1Cs drop by one to three percent. Now that is unheard of in the, in the offices of endocrinologists across this country. Two, one to three percent a drop in hemoglobin A1C as well as reduced uh, uh, blood pressure. Unpublished, because when we put that program together, the federal government said, go, 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 go see people, go see people, go see people, or we'll take the money back. So we couldn't go through an ethics process, but we still collect the data to analyze it in a formative way for our program. Anyway, I apologize again for, for being late. Um, and, you know, the approach that we use uh, in addressing racism um, is really around deconstructing the system and then making space and room for indigeneity to occur and really to create allies for us. So we work at the university in creating ally, allies. We do not need uh, people coming from a church and feeling sorry for us at all. We don't need that. Thank you. Give a big hand to 